Praise God, praise God. Let the people of God say Amen. Amen. I welcome you to the Break Broadcast, a Bible teaching program where we edify, we exalt, and we challenge believers to the Great Commission. Here, we also call sinners to salvation through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. Today, our topic is about coming into the heel of the Lord. Coming into the heel of the Lord. And we are going to be learning from a child. Uh, I guess we all have a lot to learn from children, huh? So today our case study is Abijah, the son of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom in Israel. After the united Israel divided into two kingdoms, the southern kingdom uh, was known as Judah, and the northern kingdom was known as Israel, and Jeroboam was the first king, the son of Nebat. So we are going to be talking about his son, Abijah. And a short reading is 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 1, we stop at 13. 1 Kings 14, verses 1 to 13. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Sweet Lord Jesus, we have in your holy name. Blessed Holy Spirit, be thou exalted. Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, we ask that you speak to us through this lesson. Let the light of your word open our eyes and enlighten our hearts that our Christian walk may become better as a result of this lesson. Help us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I will pray. Amen and Amen. Our foundation text is the book of Psalms, chapter 24, from verse 3, I will stop at 4. Psalm 24, 3 to 4. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. What does it mean to come into the heel of the Lord? What it means to come into the heel of the Lord is to be able to, to have the confidence to approach God, to stand before God. There is nothing between you and God. There is no hindrance between you and God in fellowship as his child. You have the boldness, the confidence to appear before God. And it is also to be recognized by God. When you say, Father in heaven, God says, that's my baby speaking, you see. That is, that is what it means to come into the heel of the Lord. Not when you, you are praying because you are a hypocrite or you are, you are a non-believer and something happens and you start praying these emergency prayers and God says, who? Who is that? You see, to come into the heel of the Lord is to be recognized in heaven by God. What can we do to be recognized by God? Number one. According to our foundation text uh, from Psalm 24, verse 4a, we must have clean hands and a pure heart. Our heart speaks of our molding, while our hands speak of our deeds. The heart molding controls the hands' movements. It does not matter the size and shine of what we do for God. If it does not come from a pure heart, it has no significance before God. The Israelites built a magnificent temple of worship to God. When Solomon was the king between 970 to 931 BC, 
For God just sound that he would destroy that temple if the people failed to obey him. Some 400 years later, guess what? That temple was destroyed. God allowed Judah to be overrun by enemies and they destroyed that temple. You see. In 586 BC, according to the Jewish virtual library, Abijah was the only one who reached God's past mark in the family of Jeroboam. Thus, he was exempted from the curse placed on his father's family. Our heart is a representative before God. Let's go to Psalm 58 verse 2. Psalm 58 verse 2. This is God speaking. Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye win the violence of your hands in the air. You see, you can see the heart and the hands together interwoven in that Bible verse. In plain English, that one is saying, you do the work of wickedness in your heart and you practice the evil that your heart has imagined with your hands, the violent works that you have planned in your heart, you do it with your hands. That's what that Bible verse is saying. Let's go to Psalm 50 verse 16. Psalm 50 verse 16. But unto the wicked God said, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? In American English, God is saying, listen, what right have you to take my name in your mouth? What right have you to take my promises that I've made to my children in your mouth? Because your heart is not right. And your hands, they work iniquity. You see, purity, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. Forget it. That you built a church for God, that you bought a, 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 a car or van for the church, or you gave the largest time, that has nothing to do with God. God doesn't uh, live in houses, God does not drive cars, and God definitely does not spend money. So if your heart is not pure, if your hands are not pure, it doesn't matter what you give to God. Your gift cannot impress or affect God, but your heart will have effect. Let me say that again. Your gift cannot impress nor affect God, but your heart will have effect. God can only take offerings or gifts from pure heart and clean hands. If the heart is not pure, if the hands are not clean, you have just wasted your gift. You didn't give it to God. Moving on. To come into the heel of the Lord, you must lack vanity. According to Psalm 24, verse 4b, our foundation text, we must not lift up our soul to an idol if we want to stand boldly before God. If you don't want any hindrance between you and God, you must not lift up your heart to an idol. An idol is anything that you love more than God, is anything that you care for more than God, is anything that you fear more than God. That is your idol. This means not to be controlled by self-ambition other than the word of God and the will of God. The son of Jeroboam was not ambitious for anything. Of course, he's a child, you see. So his life was not controlled by any idol. The Lord Jesus said, please listen up. Unless we change and become like little children, we will never, and this is Jesus speaking, never enter the kingdom of heaven. This means Christ and his will must be the center, the pivot of our life. Christ must be our highest 
priority. All the plants must pass through God's inspections lens or we must be ready for our plans to change according to his will. Now some things are no brain. If you're a child of God, you just know that you need God to give you specific direction before you take action. For example, who to marry? If you are to buy a house, that house or not buy that house. If you are to go to this college or not go to this college. If you are to buy this car or not to buy this car. You see. If you are to take this job or not take this job. Or if you are to leave this job or not. Those things are no brainer. If you are a genuine child of God. God has to speak before you take action. For some other things. You don't need to pray about. For example, God, should I wear yellow or blue today? Hello? We have the mind of Christ. God, should I take north to downtown or south to downtown? You don't need to pray about that or seek the face of God to tell you. However, as tiny and as little as those things may be, on what to wear or which way to take going downtown. Be ready for the Holy Spirit to change your plans like that. If the Holy Spirit says, I know you usually go through the north route to go downtown, but just in Zion, I want you to take south today. Turn the car around, go south. Because you don't know what the Holy Spirit is saying before it's asking you to change the direction. So that's why I said, all our plans must go through God, or we must be ready to change plans. Some, you don't need to pray about, but be ready to change that plan. A good example is uh, that of Apostle Paul. He was in Bithynia, and they were planning to go back to Asia Minor to go visit the churches there. It's doing mission work, you see. But God said, no. In the middle of the night, the Lord showed him a vision, and God led him through that vision to Macedonia, you see. God needed for the gospel to come into Europe. So God changed the course of Apostle Paul's uh, missionary journey at that point, you see. And Apostle Paul immediately changed his plan instead of going to Asia Minor, they went to Macedonia. When we live like that, we put Christ in the pilot seat of our life. And he becomes our Lord and our Master indeed, you see. Um, I, I like to view it this way. In my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, is my father. So when I'm having a bad time, I'm struggling, something is bothering me, I'm talking to my daddy, you see. And I'm waiting for my daddy to speak to me. But when it has to do with the assignment he has given me in the ministry or to minister to somebody, he is my employer, you see. I'm his employee. So he tells me what to do, and I'll do it. You don't go to your workplace and tell your manager or your CEO, uh, this is the way I want it done. Maybe you have a new job. Your CEO will be happy to show you the exit door, you see. But as long as you still love your job, you follow what your CEO says, right? So that's the way I view my relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that helps you too. Now, another example was King David. His heart's desire, his crowning moment, would have been to build the temple in Jerusalem. And God said, no, you are not going to do that because you have shed so much blood. Your son will build that temple. And King David, though painful, but he said, okay, Lord, 
you win. He agreed with God's verdict. That is not having vanity, self-ambition drive you. Let's go to Proverbs 20, verse 24, and I'm going to be reading from God's Word translation. The Lord is the one who directs a person's steps. How then can anyone understand his own way? In plain English, that Bible verse is saying, you didn't make you. You didn't create yourself. So how in the world would you know what's best for your life? Huh? How would you? I didn't know what I was supposed to do, but I knew that I would love a little bit of this part of the job. I love teaching, but not every part of teaching in, in, in high school. I love working in an office environment, but not every part of it. And now at a point I was so confused, and I was like, how do you take a part of this and a part of that to join it together? What kind of an assignment, what kind of a job can give me that? I couldn't find any until the Lord called me to come and to come and preach and start Bible teaching. You see, a part of this that I love and a part of that that I love, I find everything complete in this assignment. The same thing for you. God has a plan for you if you're a genuine child of God. He has a plan for you. So he's the one who know exactly what he made you for. So it's not in yourself to direct your own life. No. Let God's word become your drive and God's word will become your light. Let me say that again very slowly. Because we live in a microwave world we want everything on the run. It does not work like that if you're a child of God. Let God's word become your drive and God's word will become your life. Moving on. We are not only to have purity. We are not only to lack vanity. We also need to have dignity. Psalm 24 verse C, a foundation text. The third, uh, the third uh, criteria that we need to watch out for out of that uh, out of the three criteria uh, that we need to before we come before the uh, before the Lord into the heel of the Lord says we must not swear deceitfully all kinds of making promises and not fulfilling them lying under oath mentioning God's name as your witness when you know you are lying, but because you are bent on wanting to convince the other person, then you call God as your witness to a lie. These are all swearing deceitfully. And do you know what that means? It means for whoever is practicing that, they lack spiritual dignity. I wish I, honestly, I wish it had turned out differently. But the, the people who have lied to me most since I started working in the ministry have been Christians and many of them pastors. Pastors, they call themselves. I will, I will come by the ministry and see you tomorrow, uh, Friday. And it's been two years or three years. No phone call, nothing. To say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, maybe I had a little change of uh, uh, program. That's what, nothing. I can start giving you examples. And these, these people call themselves pastors, you see. So if you are in that category, according to the word of God, you don't have spiritual dignity. And it is abhorrent before God. 
Because a lying tongue is the byproduct of a deceitful heart. Any kind of deception can never find favor in the sight of God. And so is everyone who practices it. Jeroboam, through deceit, lied to the children of Israel. And so he led them into idol worship. Please go read that story in 1 Kings chapter 12. Please, I want you to go read it. And for that reason, God never forgave Jeroboam for leading the northern kingdom into idol worship. However, Abijah, Jeroboam's son, being a child, was yet to learn how to speak deceitfully. How about you? Have you been teaching your children how to lie? Huh? Telling them if so and so call me on the phone, tell him or her I'm not home. If you have been doing that, you need to stop. It's a great sin before God. God saw Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, as the only one with dignity in his father's family. The Lord Jesus said, Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. So if you are a liar, you promise you don't fulfill it. You are in the same class with all those things that I've mentioned, according to the word of God. How do they call you that? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm too timid to call you that. That's what Jesus said. God will not look favorably on the one who does not have spiritual dignity. Let's look at Leviticus 19, verse 11. Leviticus 19, 11. You shall not steal. It's not an opinion. Nor deal falsely. Again, a command. You break one, you break all. You see. Nor lie to one another. I will call you tomorrow. You already knew you are not going to call that person. You're a liar. And the Bible says, Thou shalt not. It's a command. To lack spiritual dignity is to lack natural integrity. Let me back up and slowly bring it back. We need to hear that in the body of Christ. To lack spiritual dignity is to lack natural integrity. There is no way you can have natural integrity if you don't have spiritual dignity. No. Because spiritual dignity controls your natural integrity. So what have we done so far? What can we do to come into the heat of the Lord? Number one, <coughs> excuse me, have purity. This is to have a pure motive leading to pure behaviors or deeds. Lack vanity. This is to live according to God's will and not self-ambitions. To have dignity is the third criterion. This is now to knowingly and falsely swear or promise. As a genuine believer whose sins has been forgiven and you have the Holy Spirit of God in your heart, are you a child that has the boldness to come before our Father in heaven? Or sin has put a wedge between you and, and, and our God? And so you cannot boldly approach God. You can change that today in Jesus' name. Don't listen to the lie of the devil that God is not going to forgive you. The devil is a liar. Confess and repent. Okay? And come back into fellowship. God has not disowned you if you are a genuine child of God. No. You don't disown your children for disobeying you, do you? You discipline them, yes. But you don't disown them. How much more God? 
So if you know you have disobeyed God, He has not disowned you as a child of God, genuinely saved. Confess and repent and come back into fellowship in Jesus' name. Now, if you go to church, but you are not sure that your sin has been forgiven, and you are not sure the Holy Spirit is in your heart, or you know you don't have the Holy Spirit because you are not living a holy life. Listen, I hate to tell you, but I cannot say anything against the Word of God. You are baptized by God. Oh yeah. You're going to church, but you are a Christian, a pagan Christian. That's not a right terminology, but that's who you are. And that's a form of spiritual monstrosity. Because you are either a Christian or you are either a pagan. But that can change. Okay? Now, if you have never trusted the Lord Jesus to ask him to forgive you your sin and for him to come into your heart and make you his child, listen, you are a pagan pagan. A star pagan, a number of them. God does not recognize a baptized pagan and a star pagan, a non believer. God does not recognize the two of you because you do not have His Holy Spirit in your heart. The Bible says, Those who do not have His Spirit do not belong to Him. So I'm not just telling you some stories. No. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in your heart, you are not one of God's children. However, this is the best part. You ready? That can change right here, right now. Oh yeah! God can adopt you as he did me. And as he adopted many of my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. After being adopted by God, then you can talk about coming into his presence with boldness. I mean, there's nothing hindering you from coming before God and say, Daddy, you see. And then you begin to have relationship and fellowship with the Father through our Lord Christ Jesus. If you are ready for that adoption, listen. It's just a click. A link is coming. Click on that link. We meet you there. All right? Father, we thank you. That we can call you our Father. Oh, Lord, we are very grateful. Help us there, Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, to always obey you, the grace to obey you. Release it upon us in abundance, oh, Lord, so that nothing will hinder us from coming freely into your presence. And for those who are going to want to know Jesus' faith, Father, I pray that by the Holy Spirit, they will have the understanding of what it means to receive our Lord Jesus Christ into their lives. For in Jesus' name, I will pray. Amen and Amen. I will see you next week. Only if Jesus has not spread the sky open.